Yes. Hello, hello, everyone. This is December 12th, and we are at Application Performance Weekly Team Meeting. And let me share my screen. And we don't have anything non-verbalized, so let's move to our board. Uh, OK, so let's start with closed issues. Just as you, Nicola. Sorry, I was muted. Yes. Yeah, so this is the part of the work for replacing the uh, sidekick memory killer with the watchdog. So uh, can, can you go back to the board because they're in mm -hmm. different order. So we introduced the sidekick event, event reporter for watchdog. This is, this is introducing additional logs uh, and metrics for Sidekick. Uh, I think the description is actually in the MR. Maybe I should copy it here as well. And yeah. So for example, for Sidekick, we are logging additional things like running, currently running jobs. So when we decide to kill and restart the Sidekick process, we need to log and add to metrics like the currently running workers so we got an idea like what is causing this high memory uh, limits and why the sidekick process was restarted and the follow-up is just cleaning up a code a little bit like we figured out that for example the monitor class that is currently monitoring the uh, running jobs has mutex being public and access like across the board. So we did some refactoring to make this private and access easily uh, and safely accessible. So that's it. Yeah. Thanks, Nicola. Yeah. Thanks. And the next one is, yes, the next one is you and Yeah, we, <laughs> we both uh, worked on this. Uh, thanks, Nicola, for uh, yeah, pairing and doing a little demo that was very helpful. Uh, we, we thought it would make sense if we have two faces on this because uh, Nicola had worked a lot on this code in the past. Um, I think it was part of a rapid action at some point, I think, to mm -hmm. take load of the primary, the database primary. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we kind of got sidetracked a bit with this whole <laughs> ownership discussion again because it's, so back then there, there were there, the database team was like short on staff and uh, we helped out as part of this rapid action to, um, yeah, Reduce load on, on the database primary, so so we ended up working on this um, load, yeah, utilizing the database load balancer for Psychic. Um, so so somehow then there was a bug, and it's then kind of circled back to us. So, so this is kind of why we were working on this. Um, yeah, so we got we got the immediate issue fixed. Um, uh, that was actually fairly straightforward. I think most of the time was spent discussing about where to evolve, kind of what should be the you know proper solution to this, and where to evolve which direction to evolve the load balancing code. Um, uh, so we, we basically what we did was we kind of split these two discussions and like, here's the actual fix for the for the problem, like you know, using the code we have now, uh, and then kind of spin out these like four other points or so that were being dis discussed um, into a separate issue and kind of hand it over to, to group database. So that's kind of how, how we landed on, on this in, in the end. So um, so yeah, we hope the customer issue, this was reported by a customer, I think. Uh, so uh, we hope that should be addressed. We've never even run into this problem in production, right? Because it's very unlikely that all of the mm. database replicas are down. If that happens, then GitHub is down. Uh, so um, then this would be our least problem. Uh, but, but yeah, like there were these uh, temporary conditions under which this could happen apparently in some installations. So, so it should be done. Thank you. Thank you both. And mm, let's move to in review. Okay. So this is from you, Matthias. Yeah. Uh, I realized in the end, this should have probably been an epic because it had been in development for a while because there were uh, a bunch of MRs attached to this. Uh, so for the last one, I moved it to in review. Uh, so uh, so the implementation work is done. So we do have the ability to uh, collect Ruby heat dumps now, as the title says. Um, it's behind an ops toggle. 
and um, we uh, we could, in theory, use this now, but there's a number of reasons why we won't. Uh, one being that um, uh, there is still a bug in uh, this has nothing to do with heat dumps, heat dumps, but like we found we found out that this was a problem, uh, a bug in yeah in Prometheus client MMAP where um, uh, there was a bug in the way it manages uh, heat memory where if you then in the process look at the entire heap and that's what a heat dump does right it just walks the entire heap uh, it, it would trigger this crash uh, uh, so so we we kind of need to fix this first right otherwise. Um, uh, we might be crushing uh, Ruby instances in, in production. We don't want to do that. Uh, another consideration was um, so uh, uh, producing heat dumps is, is not super cheap, right? We, we only want to do this when when a worker stops. Uh, so we're going to go about this carefully. Um, so uh, yeah, we would we would probably test this on stage staging first before we put this into production. Uh, and um, another step we need to do still, which happened in parallel, was that. Not 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 the capturing side of the data, but like where where we put it into GCS, uh, we changed the way that's handled. So that used to go into a bucket that uh, was created in our GCP project, and we we moved that into the GitLab production project, um, so that um, other developers could potentially have access to this as well, not just our team, uh, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and also the rules are a bit more stringent there. So because a heap dump may contain, uh, I don't actually remember what's part of a heap dump if, if there's also if there might be you know potential mm. data in there that way we might be kind of interesting mentally. so i don't know that was one consideration at least in general around these reports not just about heat dumps right because um uh, there might be other reports that may contain such sensitive data so i think there was another reason why we said it might be better um to move this into the gitlab production project where uh, access is really like locked down a lot so everyone needs to go through an access request so mm -hmm. uh, but that also means that right now we don't even have don't have access to that data ourselves <laughs> <which> is, <laughs> so we kind of lock ourselves out there yes uh, so yeah so, so what i'm saying is that there are a few smaller things uh, that we still need to do um to actually utilize this but i still consider the, the issue uh done as soon as we um fix this Prometheus bug because that's the only showstopper really on the blocker. Yeah. That's it's great. funny, it's funny that we started all of this because we don't have access. <laughs> yeah, there's some irony. There. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sorry. And the next one is from me and Nicola. So uh this one I believe we have a merge request follow-up from Nicola and it's just missing some, you know, some danger bot fixes. So we'll close it early this week. Yeah. Uh, I have a general question to the team. Uh, like we introduced this server, uh, like service measuring tool while we were working on import exports rapid action like two and a half years ago. And this measurement tool is like generic one, but requires two modification to the code. Like if you want to use it, you need to prepend it to the certain model or class or service or whatever. And then you need to flip the feature flag in order to enable it on production and measure it because of the performance concerns that like the whole measuring tool will, will do in the background. So, uh, I didn't see that anyone used this at all from like two and a half years. And another thing is that when we remove these feature flags, like we will have a lot of unused code in the in, in our repository. So I'm thinking of removing the tool completely because yeah, I think maybe maybe that's I agree. a uh, good reason. To, uh, because I think we kind of build it for ourselves, but yes. Um, and it, it was useful at the time, but um but we didn't as well use it like for two and a half years. So yeah, yeah. it's also like needed... kind of tools like you, you cannot use them in production, right? It's just always for local workloads. Mm. So they're very limited. They're very yeah, limited. it was useful if you want to test something on, st on staging and staging only, like mm. you just enable feature flag there okay, yeah. and do, do some measurements. But right, yeah, right. It's, mm. it, it's really not something that a lot of people use, so. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be against kind of further Further, we had like an epic where we kind of consolidated all of this different tooling, and but there was so much overlap, right? As well, mm, that's true. Um, so, so 
Yeah. Yeah. So I created yeah. separate issue to clean up this tool as well because the first the first time I will just address the feature flags removal yeah. and. I mean, if you still because also the problem is it's it's then you know it's it's not part of the the main code base that everyone works with, which always adds a little bit of noise for everyone, right? And then there's documentation we need to maintain. Mm. If, you, if you feel like you might still use it um, every now and then, we also have our team tools repository mm -hmm. uh, where you know we could also keep it there. I, I don't know. Or oh, is it gem? Work. Good idea. Yeah, I don't know if it's worth the effort. But... Mm. It could be. Yeah. That's it about in review. What about blocked? I think most of the things renamed. Uh, remained unchanged, right? Yeah, what about... I didn't spend this any time this week for that. Kind of blocked still on what Alexia and I are working on right now. So maybe we can talk about that. Yeah, we will talk in, in depth. Yeah. So this is still, I think, blocked, but there was some progress, right? Because not really. I mean, I meant to talk about Ruby 3 later a little bit. So yeah, okay. Okay. Kind of and uh, feature flag rollout is from Roy, I think. Do you think we yeah. could close it or is it still? No, we need, need to review it. milestone. Ah, okay. Yeah. So next week it will be closed. Okay. Great. And then from the dev, this is for GME, GitLab metric exporter. So to sum up, we noticed that we see some spikes with GME in staging. And surprisingly, we don't see similar spikes with Ruby exporter, but taking into account all the measurements I've done, um, GME is always better in terms of memory than Ruby exporter. So this is very confusing. And we're still in exploration phase, I would say. We have a few actionable items already. One of them is to add a metrics about file sizes of these samples, what I'm currently working. And also Matthias wanted, Matthias, could you take it from here? I think you wanted to do a rollout, right? Yeah, I mean, I only started to look at this today, but um, um, yeah, it's very confusing because, so so basically we, we don't see the problem in production that we can produce locally. <laughs> so it should kind of be happening, but it isn't. So the question is why? Uh, so outside of adding uh, some more metrics around, yeah, file sizes like Alexi, mentioned that would be interesting to to see if there's some cor correlation between the, the, the files on disk that we parse and serve uh, and these memory spikes. Uh, and I was thinking as well, an another problem is that, um, so on production, we still run the old Ruby exporters and then on staging, we run GME already everywhere. Uh, so uh, we, we can't really compare these very well, right? Because uh, staging is not production. So um, yeah, it's, it's a whole, uh, yeah. Like different, different. It's not not an entirely different uh, uh, topology, but you know, totally different database and all that. So, um, one idea was to uh, perform a mixed deployment to staging, where uh, maybe just on Canaries we run GME uh, and still run the Ruby exporter uh, on all other nodes, or vice versa, something like that, so that we can actually look at one environment um, uh, and see if these spikes are happening. Because we need to kind of get to a point where we um, yeah, kind of divide and conquer, you know, see like where this problem even might be coming from. So we're still kind of, kind of uh, not not sure like uh, where this is even uh, coming from. So we're, yeah, feeling out our way still here. Yeah, thanks a lot well, for the great summary. And the next one is from you, Matthias. Yeah, that's just the yeah, you mentioned that issue for. That's an ops toggle. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I noticed like you did one for the JMLX report. I have never mm -hmm. like, because the, I, I don't know what the purpose is of these issues for ops toggles, because you, usually the point is that you roll it out and then you remove the feature toggle, right? Because then the rollout is complete. Uh, but the, the whole purpose of the ops toggle is to not remove it. So, I mean, I, I, I'm still gonna update it like with what's going on, but um, it's probably not super useful. Uh, yeah, yeah, I it's think it's part of the process too. Yeah. One. Yeah, I think they mentioned like that if you want to keep the flag, so they have this, you know, separate workflow for keeping the flag. So yeah, part of the process, I guess. Uh, okay. All right. A bit. Uh, so and the next one is from you, Nicola. Yeah. So since we now have the sidekick part in the watchdog ready, I just want to 
like set the uh, flipper for environment variables. So if the watchdog is enabled, we don't start setting daemon memory killer. So once we enable the the watchdog for set kick, it will just use the watchdog instead of the set kick memory killer. The only thing that I'm thinking about adding here is currently we will run watchdog even if no monitors are configured and it can happen because currently we have sidekick memory killer enabled only for the specific shards like catch all shard and urgent cpu bound shard and other shards that doesn't run sidekick memory killer at all so i'm just thinking if we don't start the watchdog if no monitors are configured or something like that so mm. we have the similar behavior here as well. So I will probably include that in, in, in this issue. OK, thank you. Uh, and then so... the only remaining next step is to enable the watchdog by default for Psychic. And that's it. We are done. Cool. Yeah, it was an epic epic. Epic epic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, great yeah, to hear this. And yeah, that's everything from the board. Anything else, Roy? You yeah. want probably to add something yeah. about ACL? Uh, yeah, Redis ACL. I'm still working on that. I've been uh, starting writing or answering the questions. There's three or four questions in the description. I can link the issue. Yeah, I the could. Docs will be um, uh... mainly like what comments do does the new user need to have and how does it work with self-managed um so yeah i've been reading through the docs and i've been starting writing a proposal slash answering the questions hoping to get that um get some eyes on that sometime this week sooner rather uh, later who will handle this which team uh, after you will good create question. a proposal good question i am not sure uh i think okay. uh, what we agreed before was if there are any uh development side of mm -hmm. work our team will take it over yeah yeah if it's like a more like a um, administration work mm -hmm. i think uh, we should uh, we should hand it over to infrastructure team right okay yeah from what i can tell so far it's mostly administration work um all on the redis site which we as a team don't even have access to so yeah, but I will still uh, answer the questions and then see how to go from there. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yep. Cool, thanks. And yeah, so that's it from the board. And let's go to the team topics. Uh, first, I wanted to highlight that, yeah, I'm helping with consolidating this 15.8 playing issue, and I may need a bit of your help. So. Uh, especially, uh, could you please, if you will find some time, just quickly review it. And thanks, Matthias, a lot for adding these two sections and write some great summary. I basically use them for these two main topics. And I want some input from Nicola. I, I've heard today mm -hmm. some new stuff, so I, I, I still remember it and I will update this section, but feel free to edit it and consolidate. And yeah, basically, if you have something to add, feel free to add it here or on the individual issues. Sounds good. And if you want to discuss it, we could do it now. I think what's interesting, recent proposal from Matthias that um, on this topic, investigate Puma long-term memory use. So Matthias suggested we may want to analyze reports. So I created a new issue. If you have something to add, please do. And another proposal from Matthias, but I'm not sure if we're going to take this into work next month stone or not is this issue oh it's broken it's uh, feature gates so what are your thoughts are we going to take this into 15.8 or are we too busy and spread thin to take this what's your um, opinion yeah i actually forgot to mention that earlier because another problem with enabling heap dumps on production once they are working uh, and we have access to that data is that we currently toggle these reports um for it is fleet wide basically, right? Because because it's an application feature toggle. So every Puma worker or every sidekick worker will receive this update. So that's 
kind of opening the floodgates, you know, um, with, which we don't know yet. But I guess we sort of know that for Jay Malloc, there was that was a lot of data, right? It was. Uh, because, um, yeah, I, I was actually like, we didn't, I thought we had done the math behind it, uh, but maybe. <laughs> I think maybe, I miscalculated, miscalculated we, with the amount of uh, clusters we have, really, like, I didn't take right, this but into account. We did look at no code and everything, and um, uh, I, I thought I thought that every two hours was sounded quite conservative, um, but but yeah, I don't know. That, anyway, like, so there's other, like, levers for this, right? Because for the JMLC reports, because it's based on a timer, we can also tune the timer, right, to just say, well, maybe just do it once a day or something, uh, to to kind of rain in the data volume uh, and, and we ship compression right so uh storage so uploads will be faster and storage will be less um uh and, and for, so for heap dumps it's, it's a bit different because we only trigger them when there's a memory threshold violation right so it's it's not like if you turn this on then every puma worker starts to dump heap that's not how it works uh, it just sets this signal that if there is a memory violation then but but this mm -hmm. is really for every puma or psychic worker um uh, if there is a violation, then upon stopping uh, the process, uh, it it will perform a, a heat dump. And, and there's a number of unknowns because uh, this this means also that um, this worker will be out of the uh, rotation for um, picking up requests from the shared request queue. Uh, this is not a problem we had with JMLOC reports, um, which basically means that uh, we're running, uh, we might be running short on, on workers because yeah, without getting too much into the weeds here, but like there is some supervision logic in Puma where the primary um, it expects uh, the workers to dial in periodically, and if they stop doing that, uh, then primary will think it crashed uh, and it will start a new one. So there's all of these weird edge cases where I don't know if it's, if it takes too long to produce a heap dump, uh, there might be knock-on effects that um, uh, could be problematic. So so we want to kind of do this carefully. So that's why I thought it would be super helpful. Uh, it would be safer, but also just in generally, actually a much more sensible workflow uh, to target uh, individual nodes or processes with a feature flag, rather than saying, you know, uh, in every single GitLab production worker, you know, uh, produce, an, produce a heap dump uh, during, during shutdown. That would just reduce the blast radius so much. Uh, yeah, so I work on a POC for this already, just to see yeah. if it is possible. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so actually, um, so creating these kind of these feature gates is, is not the hard part. So I think I have a solution for that. But um, there, there's a bunch of other crop that I hadn't thought about, which just creates a bunch of work to do that because the way we toggle features in production is through chat ops. Uh, so it's a chat bot. And then it takes these kind of hard-coded uh, parameters. So we would have to patch chat ops to understand that there's a new actor. So the new actor would basic, basically be like the process or the node, right? Um, but then ChatOps performs an API call into GitLab to enable that feature. So we need a new REST endpoint mm. uh, that we need to patch to also support that. So, so, there, so there are all these integration points I hadn't thought about um, uh, that we have to then build. Uh, it's, it's not like a ton of work. I, I think this could be super, super impactful for this kind of work that we do, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we'll keep this in the next month's tone, but yeah, yeah, maybe we it's are a, not committed to deliver it. Stretch it, but, goal. Yeah, but yeah, um, stretch goal. It, because like ultimately, uh, we will never the, the main point, like the we need to think about like why were we building this feature, right? The ability to pull heat dumps. Uh, and it wasn't to diagnose problems on staging, right? Because on staging, these problems that we see are almost never as pronounced or don't even exist, right? Because staging receives almost no traffic, right? So, so mm -hmm. all of these memory issues that we have over weekends, especially, this is on very hot production nodes, right? That receive a lot of traffic. Um, so, so we need a, a way to do this safely in production. So, honestly, at the end of the day, we might e we might not even get around doing this or some something equivalent. You know, maybe there's a better solution than using feature toggles. That was just like one idea. You know, so if you have other ideas for how how to go about that. Um, Camille mentioned like he would prefer a solution where we just use the percentage-based uh, rollout, but that's then super untargeted, right? So that doesn't really solve our problem because then you just perform heap dumps on random nodes, right? That might not even have a problem. So, so mm. it's kind of like, I don't know, um, it, it feels like um, 
it's a very untargeted way of, of, of profiling, right? That's not really useful, I think. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the update. Yeah, so please uh, check this plain tissue if you find them. I, I have a specific question re related to the heap dumps for the Puma, yes. not, not just for the Puma, like if we are running the heat dump when we are close, so like exceeding the memory limit, is there a concern that OM killer we kick, will kick in and terminate the whole thing before we collect the heat dump? Uh, this could happen. I mean, it's not a problem. Like the uh -huh. OM killer, um, uh, yeah, it, it, yeah it, might, it might happen. Yes, the answer mm -hmm. is yes. So mm -hmm. it, it would probably mean that would be like a half written file on disk that we upload. Uh, it's it's an interesting question. Like uh, we will we will we, I don't know. Like I can't tell you. Like uh, because also all all of this timing, all of these timings that we pulled, you know, from our dev machines, they're just not representative of a you know busy uh, Puma worker in production. You know, and uh, we saw that on Sidekick, these gaps are even more pronounced, right? Because we have resource limits where some Sidekick uh, uh, containers get like you know half a CPU or something. Mm -hmm. something. So. Uh, if you then have these really CPU heavy tasks where you know MRI is walking the entire, you know, is walking like two, two and a half, three gigabytes of Ruby objects, then you know, I, I don't know, I don't know how long that takes. I, I can't tell you before de deploying this and <laughs> enabling this. That that's that's why I would prefer to have a way as well to do it safely and like on on a single node, maybe not just not everywhere. Uh, if our watchdog works properly. Uh... Would it be able to just take a heap dump before it restarts the process? That's exactly how it works, actually. So yep. we use the watchdog um, uh, integration points, basically, to uh, or we use it as an integration point to uh, schedule these heap dumps. So uh, so if you turn the feature flag off, we, we kind of basically only signal the intent, you know, that, that this should happen, uh, and um, or, or we unblock the, the the actual logic for performing the heap dump. And um, if the watchdog detects like a memory threshold violation, um, uh, it will uh, it will actually set the it will actually schedule the heap dump so so that once the worker shuts down, uh, it will uh, execute that. I have a clarifying question. If I was to like zoom out here, so I understand that this is generally part of the theme that was carrying a long time ago about like making sure memory usage is appropriately managed, I think. And I think historically, my understanding is that there were just some issues with like GitLab just taking a lot of memory to run. And I think less of a problem for us, but maybe more of a problem for some self-hosted instances. I guess I'm curious, like we could optimize and investigate this forever, but I'm curious, like, is there a threshold at which we have determined like this memory consumption rate, error rate, whatever, restart rate is good enough and, and we're happy with that particular level of optimization that we're aiming for? Is that a thing that we have? Yeah, that's a that's a really great question. It reminds me a bit of the discussion we had with the uh, the, um, the componentization architecture blueprint or whatever it was called, the, you know, modular Ruby app, because the, the, the proposal was also, here's his, his this whole bunch of work we need to do, you know, to reduce memory use, but, you know, what, what does it actually buy us? Um, uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a good good answer to this. So I, I guess at the end of the day, it's something like, how does that convert into, you know, dollars spent on uh, on these machines that we need to buy from Google, you know, to, to, to run all of these workloads? Um, there are some... Uh, there are some side effects, right, to to having high memory use. Uh, one is that um, uh, pods or containers will restart more frequently, uh, which just this me this means for the duration of that happening, uh, we this pod will not be able to serve user traffic. So that's kind of a, a minor interruption. So basically, the more frequently we need to recycle pods due to high memory use. Um, uh, that could be a that could be a problem over time, right? Uh, another problem is that uh, GC and Ruby is a stop the world thing. So uh, this means that while GC runs, nothing else can happen. So the more memory you allocate and the larger the heap grows, this will eventually have an impact uh, on performance as well because so so latency will go up based on this. So so there's a number of these like more subtle issues I think 
that come with high memory use. But um, do we have, I, I guess the question basically was, do we have some kind of like gigabyte figure of, you know, that's okay. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think we do. Like, I, I, but I, I don't have a good, a good answer to this outside of these general concerns. Maybe this is something we can talk about with scalability again as well, because honestly, like a lot of these investigations actually trickle down to us from scalability because they run these Tamlan forecasts where kind of here's the uh, here's the um, forecast, the capacity planning forecast. And six months down the time, uh, it, it was uh, predicting at some point that uh, our, our nodes will not be big enough anymore to, to run GitLab. So that, I think that caused some... <laughs> Uh, kind of alarm bells to ring. <clears throat> uh, so that was another reason we started working on this. Uh, but we also found all of these other like interesting uh, uh, tidbits there around uh, was some, some of the ways we were actually measuring this forecast were misleading. So um, we actually um, made good on that <laughs> to some extent. We basically fixed at least part of that problem uh, by uh, using better saturation forecast metrics. Um, so, so that it's not as pronounced an issue anymore. Yeah, but but overall, um, yeah, if you look at the epic, there were some very very pronounced uh, uh, cases where where we didn't deploy. Basically, looks like one ginormous memory leak that we run where <laughs> over the weekend uh, memory in Puma workers would like triple or so. Um, yeah, but we we did some we did some work already where you know maybe that is good enough, which 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 is the memory watchdog work where we say. Um, but it's a very blunt solution, right? It's basically saying, you know, if that process consumes too much memory over time, you know, we just we just restart it. Um, it yeah, but, but <laughs> I don't have a better answer than that. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know right now is a perfectly valid answer. I think to your point, what I hear that makes a lot of sense is like the scalability question, right? Like if we say. I don't know, let's let's pick an arbitrary number, right? Let's say our arbitrary number is one year, right? So let's say like, it takes us a year or so to build something if we need to. So let's say we say, as long as we are at, you know, next year's projection, we think we can meet whatever that scalability demand is. We're willing to pay the CPU cost. We're willing to take the performance hit of restarting processes. Then, then the question is like, okay, well, if we can do those things, then maybe our team's time is better leveraged on other higher impact things. Assuming, and I think this is maybe where your watchdog thing comes in, right? Assuming we have the monetary capability in place and the guardrails to be like, hey, um, time to look at this problem again because our assumptions have changed, our predictions for growth have changed, our compute costs have changed, whatever, right? And, and I don't know that we want to like constantly have a person monitoring, but I think if we have the appropriate guardrails where we can quickly say, hey, we should relook, I think that's totally fair. I think where I I just want to be mindful is like, I know memory optimizing, well, any optimization can be an infinite sum game. And I just want to make sure we we don't bury ourselves into a hole where, you know, it becomes harder and harder to be like, well, how much more can we squeeze out of this for the value that we collectively as a company want to get out of this? Yeah. Um, uh, another aspect we have to mention is uh, for the scalability team or the on the infrastructure side, I think that they only care probably maybe mo mostly about the GitHub.com. Uh, but for us, I think uh, we also um, have to think about the self-managed customers. Uh, from maybe from some sense, like let's say, uh, we can say, okay, uh, it's good enough for us to run uh, Git, uh, GitHub Docker, and uh, it probably doesn't worth spending the time uh, in terms of investment and, and return for GitHub Docker. Uh, but there could be a chance that uh, the memory usage or resource consumption will increase on the self managed customer side. Then those customers uh, could not be happy. So they're they're a tricky part that I want I want to mention. Yeah, I think that's a super fair point, especially because we don't have a lot of data for self-managed, but we also want to make sure that as we deploy and ask them to upgrade to newer versions of GitLab, that those newer versions make sense. I think one interesting thing that maybe doesn't exist right now, I wonder, is like, can we have in our in our modeling some sort of this is our model customer and this is the reference architecture that we want to build for, for this model customer, right? So if we say of all our customers, 99% of them are at this level of usage, consumption, performance, whatever, and this is our reference architecture. And then if we can meet that, then we say, okay, look, yeah. 
we can do more optimization, but this this meets the most for the most people for a reasonable investment. So those those are some questions on my mind, but it sounds like maybe we don't have all of that information available. Uh, uh, I think you have a good point uh, uh, saying the, inf uh, the, the reference, refer referencing architecture. Actually, uh, we do have referencing architecture some internal performance testing. I think that's uh, handled by uh, by the quality team. Uh, that can be a, a metrics for that. I, I think. Cool. Yeah. Let me let me look into that and and see and learn a bit more about how we present that information to our customers as well on the self managed side. Because I imagine they will provision their own stuff and and they do so based on our recommendations. So I think if we can say this is what we recommend and we optimize for that recommendation, then I think that puts us in a, you know, a relatively good estimation. Yeah, I think these are really good points. And and, and just to um just to clarify, so so this epic we're looking at now, that was entirely SaaS focused. So that this was we weren't really taking uh self-managed into account here. Uh, because yeah. we were only seeing it on, on SaaS and that's the only data we reasonably have access to. Uh, for sure. Yeah. So so this is kind of how how this how this started. Um, yeah, like one, one point maybe, um, so, so one tricky thing about self-managed as well is that, uh, so, so we have the, the reference architectures, but, um, to actually measure how those would perform under like real world usage, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around this because, because like, we, we don't really know, uh, so, so a lot of this is driven by data as well, right? So what, what kind of, what kind of, uh, what what does the database look like, right? Um, uh, you know, how full are the caches? How how hot are the caches? You know, the, the customers run, or um, yeah, what what parts of the product do they even use, right? So sure, they can stand up a ten k architecture or something, but I don't know, maybe maybe they only use CI, you know, and and our um, uh, version control integration, right? We, we don't really know any of these things, so it's just so difficult to say to just say like it it, it runs, you know per spec, because what does that even mean, right? It, it could still mean that they run into all kinds of different uh, performance or memory problems that we just didn't see because we, we just didn't even test with, with that specific setup. So so I think from that perspective, I think it is kind of important that we have the tooling in place as well um, to, to actually look at these problems as they come up. Um, but but yeah, like uh, this this wouldn't even do that. This is like kind of specific to SaaS right now. Uh, that's not to you say it couldn't also work on on self managed but it's not really a feature that we're building that is also documented as a customer feature. It's really just something that like we as the team can flip the switch uh, for GitLab says and to to pull down these reports. Yeah. Uh, no, and I think that super makes sense. Like we we want to stay ahead of this problem. Right? We don't want to be reactive to be like, oh shit, we're running out of memory immediately. Go fix it. Like so, I think your approach of monitoring targeted nodes or processes so that we can stay ahead of scalability predictions is a, is a good approach. I, I think with the self-managed piece, what gets interesting to me is if the customer doesn't notice a problem, is there a problem? And, and this is a little bit philosophical, but also a little bit sort of like, you know, customers pay us for a software solution and they're willing to pay a certain cost to run that software solution. And if that cost is acceptable, like, I mean, sure, we can say, yeah, we can make your compute cost $100 cheaper a month, but does that matter for that customer or are they just like, you know, maybe actually that's okay. Um, and I think that's where I, I'm trying to, I want to validate the hypothesis, whether some of the performance degradation that our customers report is actually related to some of these things, or maybe if it's just like a, a, other, other reasons and it's hard to just say, right. And I think, I don't know if everybody is on the same context here, but just, just to be on the same page, right. Like I think Matthias, you shared with me last week, maybe like, it doesn't seem like most of our delays are backend problems. It seems like there's a big chunk of like front end also just seems to take a while to load, right? So that's also part of the question where I'm like, you know, there are things that customers don't notice, which maybe are not a high priority. There are things that they call out as frictions, which are maybe more of a concern, but are they even on the level of memory or are they just somewhere else in our collective system bottleneck? And I think that's where we, we don't understand. Yeah, yeah, that's totally right. Um... Yeah, and so, so so maybe there's two discussions we should have, like what you just touched on, um, and and also uh, maybe with our infrastructure team we could sync again because I'm also not sure because like I said I think this one in particular was um, I think it, it was kind of like spawned out of uh, a Temland saturation forecast which are opened autom automatically by our system, 
Um, so yeah, it will also be good to understand there. Yeah, what's what's good enough? Kind of. I'm not sure if we ever kind of came to a conclusion uh, around that. So, so maybe that's that's a second discussion we we can have maybe with Rachel and her team. Yeah, I I don't think it's necessarily super pressing, but I think if we can align on that with the, with like the predictive side, I think that will make our peace of mind much nicer. Like just to be able to say, look. We have all this stuff we can do, but we're good for the next 18 months, 24 months, 36 months, then, you know, that's a definitively let's come back to it problem. I agree. Yeah, that's, thanks. Yeah, thank you. And the next one is from Xizhi. Oh, yeah, um, I just want to uh, have a quick uh, um, update that I canceled the meetings uh, between the Christmas and the New Year holidays. Uh, I, I believe uh, maybe most of us will take the time off during that period of time. Uh, also, uh, the first Monday of January, I think uh, uh, Alexi and I uh, will be out. Uh, so I moved our meeting uh, to Wednesday at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Anything to add? If not, let me stop share, stop recording. Thanks, everyone.